that's and okay. Ready to go. All right. So, Francois, you. Um, yeah, I'm up there. Okay, you can just tell us whenever. You're going to ask a series of questions, I would assume. Exactly right. Okay, fine. Okay. I'm just going to let you free form. All right, fine. Mm -hmm. I have questions. Okay, we were. And I have some images and things like that. All right. So, um, we're here with Victor and you love, and today is May 8th, I believe, and uh, we're at the 1330 Olympic Boulevard in Santa Monica at the Arme Davis and New Love architectural firm. So thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. So Thank you. I just want to like kind of set the scene for when you join the firm. I know that you worked for some other firms and this was in the 60s. So tell me a little bit about, you know, what the transition was like. Like why did you decide to leave the firm and what was the culture of Arme and Davis like at that point? Well, what I was doing, uh, I was in college, and uh, every summer I would come home and uh, try to get a, a uh, job in an architectural firm. And I had had a, my first experience was Medical Planning Associates, and then uh, uh, Eldon Davis of R. Main Davis um, hired me for a summer of training. And uh, this was back in 1963, and I was, when I was still in college. I was attending Notre Dame at the time. And when I was at Notre Dame, it was funny, we had, uh, I, I was the only one that wanted to seem, wanted to, to take a, a job of doing food service equipment drafting because I, first off, I needed the money as usual, most students do. And uh, the fact that uh, my load was light enough so I could really work. And I thought, gee, that's something I'm just never use. Uh, food service equipment just doesn't, you know, designing restaurants uh, really wouldn't make a lot of sense. At least that was in my own mind at the time. And uh, so one of the first projects that they gave us at college was to design a uh, restaurant. <laughs> it was really kind of funny, and I, I aced that part project. Well, anyway, the summertime I came and I went to work for our man Davis, and one of the things that I mentioned to him is that I had worked as a food service equipment uh, draftsman. And of course, they did nothing but coffee shops and churches, okay? And um, in the summertime, uh, like I was just basically a, uh, I think I was earning a dollar and a quarter an hour, a dollar thirty-five an hour, something like that, which is in those days minimum wage. And uh, somewhat uh, doing drafting, but I was also a designer. I mean, I knew how to, to draw. And I think they could recognize that pretty much right away. And so I started really right away doing sketches and designs, which for a um, you know, young man uh, not even out of college was something. The, sa the same thing happened to me in the previous job. He had discovered that I could draw. Uh, at the end of the summer, they asked me, well, would you like to come back and work uh, during Christmas holidays? And I said, yes, because again, always need the money. I did, and then they asked me, when you finish college, would you like to come to work for us permanently? And, uh, and I thought uh, this would be you know, a good way to start. I could work for them for a couple of years, and so that's what I did. So I started with them permanently in 1964. I continued to work for them by, primarily as a, uh, a draftsman and as a designer, uh, and I found that the firm gave really wonderful experience for young people. Uh, they pretty much gave you a project and let you finish it, and that is very unusual. I found that out later as how important that was to me. Um, I worked for them for a couple of years, and then I decided, well, I needed to really work for other people and get experience, and this is typically how you do it in architecture. So I um, went to work for uh, Thornton Abel, uh, and he was a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, I had worked for him at night, and so I uh, was doing um, drafting for him at night. I always worked extra. I was always working. Working was my whole life, and I uh, was married, too, by that time. Um, and I worked for him, and then work petered out for him, and I said, you know, who I really would like to work for is J Quincy Jones of Jones and & Emmons. And so... Actually, I had been accepted at Jones's office prior to taking Thornton Abel's wor uh, job, but I had taken Thor Thornton's work. I took his job first, and I was obligated, and I told Quincy Jones, I said, I can't come to work for you because 
I'm already obligating myself to somebody else. And that was a Thornton Abel, and they were good friends. Uh, but I said, you know, if things don't work out well, I would like to come there if it's possible. Well, things worked out okay, except that he guy ran out of work. So I ended up going over to Quincy Jones and, Thor and uh, Jones and Emmons. I worked there for uh, several years, and uh, I got my license in 1968. I think I was 27 years old, something like that. I got my license, and um, I learned an awful lot from, uh, from that particular firm. Uh, they were doing uh, Eichler houses. I remember working with Joe Eichler, uh, if you're familiar with the Eichler houses. Uh, yeah, and uh, I think it was one of the only clients that they allowed me to even interface with, but he was just a wonderful man, and I was doing drafting, um, again, of their plans. In fact, I've been t trying to find the original drawings that I have at home of the ones that I drafted up for Eichler. I think soon afterwards, um, they built the project, but soon afterwards, Mr. Eichler, I think, passed away. I don't think he lasted uh, that long. But I learned um, how to draft, uh, not draft, but actually to design and draw from uh, Kaz Nomura, who was one of their finest renders that they ever had at the firm. They sat right in front of me, and I, Kaz and I, I used to watch him. And so I would do renderings at night for other people. And I would do designs for Armand Davis. I continued to work for Armand Davis as a designer at night and also for other people. I worked for uh, Sandy Turner as an example, and we did uh, restoration work on Alavera Street. And so I was always out there. You know, I worked six days a week and nights and everything else. Um, working for Jones and Emmons was a, uh, it was just a job. I learned a lot, but I mean, you were, <laughs> you, you had to follow orders. I mean, they really didn't give, the training wasn't that great, but you, you could absorb what they were doing architecturally, and that meant a lot, be able to see their theory of design and everything else. Um, I started then to um, do a lot of work. I was licensed, like I mentioned, and I started doing um, house additions and things like that. And it got to the point where I was doing a lot of work. People seemed, for some reason, wanted me to do their work, so I did it. And you couldn't continue to work at Jones and Emmons and work on the side. It just, I was getting phone calls about things under construction. I mean, it was kind of, you know, that's not, I was making more money on the outside than I was inside their place anyway. So I um, got a contract for uh, General Telephone Credit Union building here in Santa Monica. And uh, plus I had other work, uh, Cindy's restaurants, things, things like that. And uh, so I decided to leave. And um, I made a deal with, and Eldon and Louie wanted me to come in as an associate of the firm. And they said, you can continue to do whatever your work you want on the side. We don't really care. We need you there basically to do our designs and, and to help us out. And then I got so busy uh, with my outside work and I kept getting contracts that I finally told them, I said, you know, I'm really going to have to leave. I said, I've got, I already arranged for going up to work to move to uh, Sandy Turner's office. I was gonna rent some space up there from him and then just you know, continue to be an architect. And they said, well, why don't you become a partner of the firm and we'll change the name of the firm. And I said, well, fine. I mean, I, I thought about it and I thought, well, gee, you know, that's painless, you know, painless way to start. Um, and I thought again to myself, I thought, well, you know, I'll last a couple of years because I know that, you know, this is, I'll try it and see if it works out. And so I started, uh, uh, they changed the name of the firm and I bought into the firm and um, they made it uh, uh, possible for me to buy in by bonuses and things like that. So I was able to pull that off uh, and continued to um, uh, do their design work and things like that. Uh, while I had been in their firm the first time, uh, I actually developed a uh, standard uh, Bob's Big Boy, which they had uh, designed, they had built all over the country, and um, they called it the Chula Vista model. And it was something for, and they let me, and I, I can't believe that people would let uh, somebody really out of college do this, work with Bob Wyan, you know, the, the Bob's Big Boy directly. And I did, and worked up the design, and. And that's when I left him to go for Jones and Emmons, okay? 
But I also had done designs for uh, Denny's as well, and I developed their last, the last Denny's design that came out of our office, and we, they built it. It was a kind of a folded plate design, and uh, my, my daughter, as an example, has the original sketch in her office over at Latham & Watkins. And um, we um, uh, built about 70 of those restaurants. I never particularly cared too much about the design. In fact, when later when I was working at uh, Miami International Airport um, doing a lot of their interior work, I n there was a, one of my buildings was right there in the front of the airport, the entry to the airport, and I never told anybody that I did that building. I just felt, you know, I didn't like it that much. But it worked, and apparently it was a successful design. And so, uh, um, but that's, uh, you know, that's basically the story. And then I got more involved in the business. And uh, I think that Eldon and Louie weren't the greatest of business people, but they did have somebody that did, uh, that worked for them. And I worked for her, and that was Helen Fong. And, so before we mm -hmm. get on to Helen, I just, mm -hmm. let's back up a little bit to the 50s before mm -hmm. you started working with them. So tell me a little bit about how their firm developed and what their focus was. Because I think the main discussion that we okay. want to have now is really about the, the coffee shop, sure. that aesthetic. Okay. So tell me, like, you know, the name of the firm, how they started, and how they kind of developed that concept. They um, started in 1947. And, and will you just start again and just tell me the name of the firm? Yeah, it's R.M.A. Davis, R.M.A. and Davis. And they started in 1947. Both of them had come out of, uh, one of them had come out of the service, and the other one I think had worked uh, maybe in the aircraft industry. I don't know. Um, they joined together and uh, started over on Wilshire Boulevard in a very small uh, office. Uh, actually, it was an old house down during, near downtown uh, Los Angeles. Uh, they, one of the first clients that they had was a fellow by the name of uh, Forrest Smith, and he... Uh, had the um, uh, clock drive-ins and clock restaurants. And so they did what I consider really a fine design of the clock restaurant. Uh, we have photos of it here in the office. Uh, great exterior design. Uh, about that same time, uh, Helen Fong joined the firm with them. And she was um, had more of a feeling of interior design than really the exterior, though she's pretty good on exterior to work too as well. Uh, it was through them that they were introduced to um, Bob Wyan because um, Forrest Smith and Bob Wyan went, I believe, to high school together in Glendale. And so he they met Bob Wyan and so they did Bob's Big Boy restaurants. Um, we also did Tiny Nailers restaurants about that time as well. But I think the best designs that they ever did back in the 50s were from Norms. And Norms, we still do work for Norms. And Norman Roybark, this is what I was told anyway, and I think that is basically true, um, was at the race, racetrack with um, a Tiny Nailer. And wanted to know how Naylor could afford to blow that kind of money and still keep coming back to the racetrack. And he says, well, it's because of, you know, some of these restaurants that I own and I'm making lots of money. And uh, Norm, who was a used car dealer at the time or a car salesman, thought, well, you know, that, that looks pretty good. So who did you use as architect? And I guess our, our man Davis. So they, he came to our man Davis then to come up with a, uh, a design and also uh, a design for their um, uh, the signs and uh, the building, the concept in general. And his idea was, in a sense, was to have a uh, automobile showroom type look, like you could look inside this restaurant. Instead of seeing cars, you would see an awful lot of people eating, and you'd see the animation and and uh, the light and the color and all of that sort of thing. And it kind of like drew you into the restaurant. Uh, so it was quite successful and the designs were full designs. Uh, they, were, they were meant, okay, for car culture because in a sense, you're, you know, you're driving. Nobody walks in LA, right? So they ever, you were trying to 
to uh, cause somebody to impulsively want to come into the restaurant by driving by. And so you wanted to come into the restaurant. The food was, and the food was cheap, and too. So it was a good bargain. Um, quite successful. And then the next step was um, a guy by the name of Harold Butler had asked, came in and had a meeting with Ellen and Louie and said that he wanted to develop these restaurants uh, called Danny's uh, Donuts and Danny's Restaurants. And so we did do a bunch of Danny's restaurants. Uh, I think uh, we have an, about 11 of them on the, you know, the, uh, on our books. But what happened was that um, Mr. Butler had a phone call from Danny's, a guy by the name of Danny and his lawyer saying, you have no right to Danny's. And Butler figured, well, what's the best way for me to change it? So he changed the A to an E, and he called it Denny's. So we started doing Denny's restaurants from that point on and did hundreds of them. Um, the, um, let me see what happened on that. Oh, and because we did the Denny's restaurants, we were fired for the first time by Norms because they were really ticked off the fact that we had worked for somebody else which is ludicrous. We were doing Bob's Big Boy, but I think that they felt that, uh, he felt that Denny's was more of a direct, uh, you know, in competition with him. So he really got mad and, uh, and fired them. It, when I was there in 63, I think it was one of the last restaurants that we actually did for um, Norm Roybark before he died. And I remember going and meeting Mr. Roybark the only time I ever met the man, and uh, it was for Norm's Long Beach, which is probably torn down, I would assume, by now. But uh, we started again doing the, the Denny's. Uh, Norm's finally hired us back, and we did other restaurants for them. And we've, I've been fired by Norm's myself personally three times. I mean, they just, you know, they fire me. Then they hire me back. So one thing that is so interesting to me is, like, yeah. the, for the coffee shops, the integration of inside and outside. Oh, yeah. Okay, so well, I can, can give you, you the theory. Can you talk a little bit about that? About sure. Give me a description of, yeah. you know, the roof and the exterior and yeah. the interior and how, you know, how thoroughly right. that concept was executed. Well, you look at the designs, uh, and you, first off, you see that they were all glass. So you had a, you wanted to be able to look through, like I mentioned to you, to be able to look through this automobile showroom, this this exhibition cooking. They'd even go back to the fact that they didn't even have the cooking. Uh, you could see it. Um, but you took the uh, landscaping, which sounds like, well, you know, so what, landscaping. The landscaping then became an integral part of the interiors. And it always did. It still does. Because we wanted to be able to, to not have a barrier except for the glass between you and what was outside. So the landscaping, a lot of times we would take palm trees and run them right through the roof and uh, uh, have this uh, really, really exotic uh, landscape designs. And they were all done by Sid Galper of Galper Baldwin, uh, Galper Pressburger, and they had a, another couple of names. But it was always Sid Galper, who was a wonderful man and did all of our work for us. So the landscaping and the, in the interiors uh, were kind of like joined together. Um, we would take the artwork to extremes inside too. Uh, everything was custom designed inside. Uh, the clocks were custom designed, the architecture, or excuse me, the, des the artwork that was on the wall. Walls were designed primarily by us through the artists that we used to work with. And we used to work with a lot of really fine artists. Um, Betsy and Hans Warner were with people that we used to work with and we have back over in the corner one of their old um, screens as an example and I have a bunch of her work and his work in my, my home because I really enjoy their work. He had escaped from Germany in the 1930s. He decided it wasn't the thing that he should continue to continue to work in, in uh, Germany 
his comment to me was he was doing a, uh, a mural in, in Munich as an example and um, his boss told him to come down off the scaffolding and he said I want you to meet somebody and all of a sudden he found himself shaking hands with Adolf Hitler and he says you know I gotta get out of this country but this is the type of people that we were dealing with they were our artists they were from Europe they were a lot of them from Europe and they were like even um, uh, Roger Derrick Herrera fought in the resistance in World War II but all these people were really they were stained glass artists but we would hire all of these artists to do our work and integrate everything the door poles were were uh, a custom design like I said the, the clocks the artwork on the walls, the signage, signage, every place was all custom designed. Um, we would design our own furniture. I used to sit around trying to, uh, or not trying, but doing and designing uh, the booth work. And you say, well, anybody can design booth work. But I remember specifically designing booth work to look like car seats because it was a car culture. And they looked like bucket seats that you'd find in a car. And I always was experimenting with uh, colors because we never wanted these restaurants to be, how do I say it, not that inviting that you would stay. Uh, the colors were bright and the theory was get them in, get them out. It's a business. And what you're designing is a food factory. Okay, you're producing food. Make them want to come in make them want to eat, and maybe don't make them too comfortable that it's, uh, you know, that they're going to stay. Um, get them out of there and turn the seat. Again, it's a business. Uh, so a lot of our colors were very bright and uh, really popping. And we would come up with these light fixtures as an example. We always did our own custom light fixtures. Or we would, we would go to the um, the people that would do like George, George Nelson, we would try to do his, use his lights. You know, you go out and buy them. But we had a company, a guy by the name of um, Glassman. But what did he call himself? I think it was, um, he designed, we did a lot of, of um, uh, designs for light fixtures through him and through other companies. We'd sit around and design. I used to design light fixtures all the time. Um, We'd also design the um, menus and get into what the waitresses, in those days there were waitresses, no waiters, so we always were interested in getting with the waitresses, what were they going to look like, what kind of things they were going to be dressing. We'd get into small wares, like what do the um, plates look like, the, you know, the whole thing. It's in a total design. And I read somewhere that you designed invented a particular can like stool, cantilever stool. So yes. Um, the, you'll see in the original design that we had for um, uh, the clock drive-in, the stool rested traditionally down straight onto the floor. Um, what Eldon and Louis, or primarily Eldon Davis designed, was the cantilever coming out. And what that gave the advantage was, was easy maintenance. But it also made everything look like it floated. So there was a design element involved. It looked good. It worked. Uh, it was a piece of usual stainless steel that was coming out of concrete, so it would support just about anything if it was designed or done correctly. Um, but And it was a maintenance item, too, as well. So it looked like a really nice design. So, yes, we just did, we did that. You could clean under it. Yeah, and the other thing we would do is uh, the chairs. Uh, I think we were exponent, proponent, what is the word for using Herman Miller's stuff. I mean, you're sitting in some classic Herman Miller stuff here, you know. That. This is, I was tempted years and years ago to throw them all away and throw this, is, this, this what is it, uh, Ames, Herman Miller, all this is Herman Miller stuff. I was tempted to throw it away, and I was smart enough that I didn't, which is really great. Um, but we would use their, uh, you know, like the Eiffel chairs and things like that. We would take them, try to come up with really the highest end design if we could. And the idea for the chef, like, to be able to see uh, inside the kitchen, the but only, yeah. yeah. So well, exhibition cooking, 
um, what you would have, either exhibition or semi-exhibition cooking, one way or another, uh, you wanted the chef to be able to see, first off, you wanted to be able to see the chef. You wanted to be, it's the animation. You're there for a show. It's actually a show, if you think about it. And one time I took a class at UCLA, uh, and somebody from Denny's was giving the class. One of the classes was in restaurant management. And he said that um, if you do not see the chef, if you do not see what's happening in the back of the kitchen, uh, you think that the fruit is coming out longer in time. That sounds bizarre, but he said they used to time it, and they would have, and they, it would come out exactly the same amount of time, but people complained more when they couldn't see the chef working. Because by seeing the chef, uh, you could watch him in some of the restaurants, like uh, in, um, trying to think of the name of the place, in one of the, what was it? There's one Norms that's still around in um, East Los Angeles on Slauson. And uh, you can actually sit there at the counter and watch the chef. You look at the, the back of the chef which isn't the greatest thing in the world, but at least you're looking and it's just a, it's a kick to watch these guys because they're, you're, you're enthralled by the fact that how they're fast the food is coming across. Um, later, they would take the chef and move him inside to a kitchen facing the people. That was better, but then how do you uh, solve the problem of uh, the exhaust systems? Because then you've got to have a hood and that sort of thing. So. What they did was they used a downdraft hood system so that the chef had an unobstructed view, or the chefs, the cooks could actually see what was going on. And um, this really helped. People could still see the fact that they were doing their, they were doing their work and they, he could see what was coming out, or he or she, or usually it was men, male cooks in those days, would be able to see what's going on in the uh, front, of the, front of the house. So, um, if you go back to uh, the diners back east, you know the traditional diners in the 1930s. They're 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 um, don't always do their designs that way. We opened up everything. We opened up the kitchen. We opened up the the walls and the glass and the whole thing like that. So, and tell me a little bit about the use of materials, that, like innovative use of materials, like mm -hmm. the egg crates or corkage or yeah, Malbihide. Well, it's funny we course used Naugahyde for the booth work uh, and you uh, then they came up with a myriad of colors that you could use which was great um, acoustical materials like on Bob's Big Boy we used um, insulation cork and actually had it milled for and get a, had a design made so that it would uh, be grooved and we would then put that on the ceiling and it was a fairly inexpensive way of achieving good acoustics uh, and then uh, the designs around the 1960s started to change uh, to more warmer colors. And so using that brown insulation cork, uh, like for the Bobs, was something that uh, they, they, people's, people's um, perception of restaurants change. And what happened was that the uh, coffee shop in Southern California started to become passe. We were still building these coffee shops in the East Coast and the Midwest who were like 20 years behind, okay? We, we would do them there. And here we were changing the design again. And we were, we, they found out in Southern California that they wanted maybe a different style of restaurant or something that was a warmer feeling and all of that and to make people more inviting. Um, so Bob's changed their design that way. And it was quite successful too, as well. And there was a lot of change that went that way around. Uh, but we used that kind of materials, and we, of course, looked at flooring materials. We're always looking at different types of um, tiles. Uh, anything that you do in a restaurant uh, had to be uh, had uh, to be able to be able to be easily cleaned, and maintained, and wouldn't uh, like we did. We would use carpeting, but only limited amounts of carpeting because carpeting had to be replaced. There was an advantage to use carpeting, however, and is that you could change the carpeting and change the feel by changing the carpeting. So that was an advantage. Uh, but even there, we would experiment with different uh, types of carpeting. We would go to 80-20, like 80% wool, 20% nylon, or 70%, and 30%, so that we would have, uh, we would experiment with different grades of 
of uh, carpeting to see how it would work and how it would maintain itself. Uh, we would use a lot of uh, terrazzo flooring as an example and come up with these really exotic designs in terrazzo. And terrazzo, uh, which is a ground material like you would put down uh, marble chips in on the floor and they would uh, end up um, uh, grinding it down and making it smooth and then it became a smooth material and it was really easily maintained. Very expensive though was one of the problems. And like access to these materials, was this something that was unique to LA? Like they were developing new things out here and you guys could try them or was that happening elsewhere? No, we were looking for new materials. I don't know if we cared what other people were doing, to be honest with you. We were always looking at what we knew we could do. I remember going to work when I, when I went to work for Jones and Emmons and to uh, Thornton Abel and those people. They didn't have really high regard for our man Davis. And I never told them that I did some of their designs. <laughs> I just didn't do it. Yeah. But was it something that was more open to in LA or things like, let's say, some of the technologies or industries here were making things available here that weren't someplace else? Or was it just you, got, you no, were no. looking for new? No, there were things here. First off, we had the aircraft industry here. Um, some of the people that actually worked for us, uh, Toby Nepal as an example, was a car designer. They were always looking at new materials. We were looked at um, um, fiberglass as an example, and uh, we tried to figure out ways of doing fiberglass things. Uh, yeah, we're always looking for. We would we would try uh, different types of lighting fixtures that might even be free floating light fixtures, as an example. So we're always experimenting with that, and uh, color was incredibly important to us. We felt that. Um, we used a lot of different materials in our buildings, which broke, a, I think, was anthema to a lot of architects that said, well, you're using too many materials. But we didn't care. What we wanted to do was to be able to give somebody, you walk into a restaurant and you'd be able to look at the walls and f furniture and everything else, and we wanted to be able to entertain you by looking at what they're, and it was always in good taste as far as we were concerned. But, uh, yeah, we experimented with a lot of materials. Uh, we were always looking at the newest, anything that comes out. Still do. I mean, when you talk about the aerospace industry, like even just the, the aerodynamic shape. Okay. All right. The aerodynamic shapes. Okay. Um, Norm's, Norm's building was an airplane wing. <laughs> it was flying. Uh, the Biff's up in... Um, was it Oakland, it was a flying saucer, okay? Um, the Denny's, original Denny's, was kind of a modifi modification of the norms design, and in its sense, the roof floated. All of these things were aerodynamical designs. I mean, they looked like they could fly. The uh, pans hovered over, you didn't know what was supported, if you think about it, what the heck's supporting this building? You know, it's just kind of like floats there and kind of hovers over the space, and yet it's all open all the way around. And that was deliberate to, to, to show that. Um, we were very interested uh, in the 1950s. You remember everything had um, fins on them, and uh, the uh, cars, you know, had fins. Everything was aerodynamical. Uh, air had these aerodynamical shapes or air aeronautical shapes, my pronunciation is not correct, but anyway, um, we, you would find designs in just about everything, not just the cars. Um, hell, they would do um, radio designs, they would do anything just to make it look like it was going to be, uh, like it was flying away or it had uh, it movement, create this movement. The other thing too, by doing that, you then found yourself um, uh, with a unique design, but it attracted, again, it attracted people. So that was, the whole idea was to attract, attract people. They called it roof-a-texture. And I, I 
somebody told me that term and I said, yeah, we're roof attacks. I, I would sit down and try to figure, well, what kind of roof am I going to come up with now that's different from the next one? I mean, it was really difficult. And sometimes you come up with these bizarre ideas, like we'd have flame, uh, planes floating in the midair and all, you know, not airplanes, but planes of the roof floating in midair. Uh, or like that one design I mentioned to you, how do, how do, oh, signage. How do I make, um, how do I really attract people into my building? If I can't do it with a roof, like I can do it with a folded plates in the roof or I could do something with the roof, but how can I do it with the signs? Eldon Davis actually designed the norm sign which was a series of pennants, then carried the design all the way through the interior so that the, we had even the, art, the, land, the uh, artwork inside had pennants. Everything was a repeat of what he did on the outside. Um, the one that I showed you earlier, of course, was the uh, El Rodeo Bowl. Well, it's a bowling alley, so what did you do? You took a scintillating bowling pin with twinkling lights for the bowling pin with a revolving bowling ball up in the top that said El Rodeo Bowl and out of the holes where you put your fingers you had colored light shooting out of the uh, top and this was 75 feet high and then the, the bowling pin went all the way into the restaurant and you could see it sitting in the restaurant too. Um, do you want to try it? I mean, what, would you want to come in there and see that place? Yeah, you probably would. You know, this is wild. This is pretty wild. It's Las Vegas. And uh, did it get built that way? I don't think so because I don't think a planning department, I don't even think back then the planning departments would let us do it. Uh, probably the cost was so prohibitive, but the idea behind it was wild. And they also experimented, um, Harman Davis did, with... Uh, the concrete uh, forms of, um, I'm trying to think of the Oscar Niemeyer or somebody like that, 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 that have these, these domes and forms and they wanted to be, create their buildings out of concrete and pour, like for a um, uh, casinos and things like that, who have these, these forms similar to what you would have at um, Dulles Airport maybe and Saarinen would do. But they were experimenting with forms. And, and I had thought one of their best designs was Carolina Pines on Ventura. And, and it was a series of, of um, forms of, uh, look like concrete, concrete forms, okay? But they weren't concrete, they're made out of plaster because we couldn't afford to make them out of concrete. And so, that particular design, uh, which was around uh, Wilshire Boulevard at uh, Ventura, was probably one of the best ones. And I always admired that design. When I was a child, my family had taken me to the Huddle Restaurant, as an example. Uh, Paul Cummins uh, had, was the owner of that. And I went to the Huddle in Santa Monica, and I was just a child. But I was amazed at the design absolutely amazed at the color, the use of stained glass, the use of different levels, how interesting this design was to walk into this restaurant. It's of course since been torn down. And I didn't have a clue who designed it, but I always knew I wanted to be an architect and I was thinking, wow, I mean, whoever did this really knew what the heck they were doing. And I, I could recognize it even then. So I just thought, that kind of thing was just, the experimentation of, uh, of design was a really important thing for these people. We always try to do that. And when you mentioned before the signage, you know, the outside mm -hmm. with the neon and, you know, and these pennants and, and it being carried through, the idea of like branding these things, that seems to me amazing, you know, that, that to think all the way through that, you know, what that, what that experience would be like, you know, not sure. just for one restaurant, but for several. Yeah, it's called consistent strategy of trying to market something. And so what you do is you take the pennant, let's say for norms, and you repeat it over and over and over again. You put it on their menu, you put it on their walls, um, you remind people. I, I was trying to think, uh, somebody once told me, I think it was Sterling Bogart who was president of norms, 
And I said, why don't we put a neon sign of norms inside the building? And he said, what do you think that our customers are stupid? They don't, they know they're in norms, but that isn't true. I mean, I think he missed the boat. Uh, you know, you do want to be reminded where you're at. And I, granted, I was going to be putting the sign and I was going to have it wash and flash and all that kind of happy stuff. They didn't want me to do that. So they wouldn't let me do it. Uh, that was kind of a kick. But you guys were really, you know, creating, you okay? Yeah, yeah, good. You want me to stop for you? Good. No, 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 no. Okay. No. That's um, good. But you were really creating like a corporate identity yes. and a franchise. Yes, we were creating a franchise. In my backyard, what do I have in my backyard? I got to have I have a Bob's Big Boy statue. I've got a Norm's Inn in my backyard. And you know what? I'm trying lobbying and I've also got a neon uh, cactus. Okay? And my wife and I are having a hell of a battle. This, of course, will never go on to on this interview. My wife and I are having a hell of a battle. I I have an opportunity to buy a Bob's Big Boy original sign, and I know where the thing is going to go. And she and I are battling. I want that thing, looking out my den door, and I want to see it. And it's it's 58 inches across, okay, and it says Bob's Big Boy on it, and I want that thing. I'm just telling you, I mean, you know, I, I just, but she just won't let me have it. I want, I love this kind of stuff. I mean, to me, it's artwork. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the way it is. But the clients, I mean, they, they were, they were engaged in this kind of desire. I mean, they knew, they understood. If they didn't, they should have, uh, if they were that dumb, uh, but most of them were pretty smart. They came to us and realizing that, uh, uh, we would help them brand themselves, yeah. Uh, for a long time, I was working uh, at Darman Davis for Elster, Elster's company in Los Angeles. And, uh, oh, we did things like um, Mickey Mantle's restaurant, and uh, which probably never got built. Uh, but I was having all, we would do all of these bizarre stakeout restaurant, which was for steaks, stakeout. And, I just, and we would come up, I did one for a, a company where I had uh, English buses driving into the building. I mean, I couldn't believe it. And I have the, the sketch here, it's outrageous. But um, we would try to give them a theme, you know, and tell them that this is what your theme should be. When we did the Mickey Mantle's restaurant, well, we made it look like um, uh, Yankee Stadium. So, you know, I don't think he ever sold any hamburgers or anything, but. Uh, yeah, I still have that design someplace around, maybe. Hmm. So let's talk about Romeo's Times Square. Sure. You were talking a little bit about the roof structure for Pan, but it seems like Roma, there was a different, it was almost inverted 